This Gruul deck wants to take big, powerful, and evasive creatures and make them even bigger and more powerful in the presence of their commander. Xenagos' ability gives target creature we control haste and plus X plus X until end of turn, where X is that creature's power. As Xenagos is always an indestructible enchantment, and only a creature if our devotion to Gruul is seven or more, it makes interacting with our general difficult for our opponents. With this caveat in mind, we can set it and forget it when it comes to Xenagos' presence on the battlefield, and turn our attention to ramping out the biggest and most powerful creatures green and red have to offer. Spoiler alert, there are a lot. Take these creatures and add a sprinkle of card draw, some pinches of cheat spells, and some dashes of additional power toughness boosts, and we have the perfect recipe for stopping our opponents into submission. <laughs> Welcome to MTG Burgeoning, your channel for all things magic. This is an EDH deck tech helmed by Xenagos, God of Revels. It is a gruel god from Born of the Gods. It is a 6-5 indestructible enchantment creature, and as long as our devotion to red and green is less than 7, Xenagos is not a creature. At the beginning of combat on our turn, another target creature we control gains haste and plus X plus X until end of turn, where X is that creature's power. It is in our best interest to make sure that we can keep Xenagos as an enchantment, because an indestructible enchantment is a lot more difficult to deal with for our opponents than an indestructible creature. Inside the 99, we're going to find some of the biggest trampy list evasive creatures that gruel has to offer so this is xenagos that is the commander of the deck and now we're going to take a look at the biggins inside as noted earlier the creatures in the 99 of this deck are going to be the biggest and baddest that gruel has to offer if you are anticipating seeing any creatures with low mana values between 1 and 3, this is not the deck for you. We're starting off with a CMC of 4, and we're working our way up, and leading off with our creatures is going to be Questing Beast. 2 and 2 green for a 4-4 four, four. Vigilant, Death-Touching, Hasty Beast. It cannot be blocked by creatures with power 2 or less. Combat damage that would be dealt by creatures we control can't be prevented, and if that wasn't enough, whenever Questing Beast deals combat damage to an opponent, it deals that much damage to target Planeswalker that player controls as well. Getting the Questing Beast into play early and often can really keep the battlefield free of Planeswalkers. And because if we get it out there early and Xenagos follows, we're sending an 8-8 seemingly unblockable creature into combat. Questing Beast is creature number one. In the Gruel 99. Next up, we're going from CMC 4 right to CMC 5. Ilharg the Raised Boar is next. 3 and 2 red for a 6 6 trample or whenever it attacks. We may put a creature card from our hand onto the battlefield tapped and attacking. We return that creature to our hand at the beginning of the next end step. If Ilharg dies, we put it, in, I'm sorry, if Ilharg dies or is put into exile from the battlefield, we may put it into our library third from the top. Because of Ilharg's attack ability and the host of magnificently, wonderfully powerful creatures that Gruul has to offer, chasing Ilharg onto the battlefield following a Xenagos God of Revels cast could lead to imminent doom for one of our opponents. Creature number three, staying at a CMC of five, that's going to be Malignus. Three and two red. Malignus's power and toughness are each equal to half the highest life total among our opponents, rounded up. Damage that would be dealt by Malignus can't be prevented. Now, Malignus does not have any form of evasion, so he could affect, I'm sorry, it could, con it could effectively be chump blocked for days. However, we do have spells and effects in the 99 that allow us to attack with Malignus's full might, trampling over anything that gets in its way. 
Creature number four staying with a CMC of five. We have Quartzwood Crasher. Two, two red and a green for a 6-6 six, six Trampler. Whenever one or more creatures we control with Trample deals combat damage to a player, we create an XX green dinosaur beast creature token with Trample, where X is the amount of damage those creatures dealt to that player. Trample is one of our preferred evasion mechanics in this deck. So it only makes sense to include Quartzwood Crasher as a way to further benefit from trampling over our opponent's creatures. Next, in our last CMC 5 creature, we have Urabrask the Hidden. 3 and 2 red for a 4-4 four, four creature with haste. Gives other creatures we control haste. And as an additional benefit, creatures our opponents control enter the battlefield tapped. Having Urabrask out there can really slow down the game plan of our opponents and their creatures. All right, going to a CMC of six, we begin with Carnage Tyrant, four and two green. It cannot be countered. It's a seven, six trampler with hex proof. What a wonderful creature to get out on a play Shh, to turn after casting Xenagos. Enable Xenagos's plus X plus X ability, and suddenly we're attacking one of our opponents with a 14, 13 trampling hex proof dinosaur. It doesn't get much better than that. Oh, but it will. Next up in the CMC 6 slot, we have Itali Primal Storm. 4 and 2 red for a 6-6. Six, six. Whenever it attacks, we exile the top card of each player's library. We may cast any number of non-land cards exiled this way without paying their mana costs. Again, similar to Malignus, Itali has no evasion. However, it's all about value. Dropping it down the turn that Zenig the turn after Xenagos is cast will net us a hopefully four additional spells to cast, further advancing our board state. Our next creature to talk about in the CMC of six is Goto Bandit Warlord. Five and a red is a 3-3. Three, three. When it ETBs, we search our library for an equipment card and put it onto the battlefield. Whenever Goto attacks for the first time each turn, untap it and all samurai we control. After this phase, there is an additional combat phase. A couple of notes about Goto. Goto is not going to untap any other samurai in this deck because there are none. It is only going to untap itself. And as another spoiler, there is only one equipment in this deck, but for the purposes of what Gruul is trying to do with Xenagos as its general, it is a doozy of an equipment. Next creature we have is Hellkite Charger. 4 and 2 red, it's a 5 5 flying hasty dragon. Whenever it attacks, we may pay 5 and 2 red, and if we do, we untap all attacking creatures, and after this phase, there is an additional combat phase. Hellkite Charger could be considered one of the win conditions in this deck. Next up we have. Hellkite Tyrant is a 4 and 2 red, 6 5 flying trampoly dragon. Whenever it deals combat damage to a player, gain control of all artifacts that player controls. At the beginning of our upkeep, if we control 20 or more artifacts, we will win the game. For the purposes of this deck, that last ability is not really going to be that helpful. However, if we're following things on curve, or maybe a little ahead of curve, and we cast Hellkite Tyrant the turn after casting Xenagos, and we turn it sideways and send it into combat, we can take one of our opponent's best artifacts and mana rocks. All right, next up, staying with the CMC of six, we have Hydra Omnivore, four and two green for an eight eight. Whenever it deals combat damage to an opponent, it deals that much damage to each other opponent. Again, we have another example of a creature without evasion. However, if we can sneak this bad boy through one of our opponents, it's going to damage every single one of the others. Staying with the CMC of six, we now have Pathbreaker Ibex. Four and two green for a three, three. Whenever it attacks, creatures we control gain trample and get plus X plus X until end of turn, where X is the greatest power among creatures we control. This was once considered the poor man's version of Crater Hoof Behemoth. However, after many moons have passed and this has yet to be reprinted, it's getting closer and closer to Crater Hoof territory. Our next creature in the CMC 6 slot is Rapacious One, a 5-4 Trampler that when it deals combat damage to a player, we create that many 0-1 Colorless Aldrazi spawn creature tokens, and they have Sacrifice, 
Add one colorless mana to our mana pool. With a quick activation of Xenagos right before combat, or during combat, of course, because it's at the beginning, we are able to swing in with a creature that can give us mana creatures, and that's only going to help us to further advance our board state. Next up, we have Savage Vetma, another evasive creature. This dragon has flying. It's a 4-4, and whenever it attacks, we add 3 red and 3 green to our mana pool, and until end of turn, this mana doesn't empty from our mana pool as steps and phases end. So similar to Rapacious One, when this bad boy attacks, it's going to reward us with mana, like Rapacious One, if it deals combat damage to one of our opponents. Next up, and rounding out our six CMC creatures, we have Scourge of the Throne. Four and two red for a 5-5 five, five flying dragon. It has the dethrone mechanic, which means whenever this creature attacks, the player with the most life or tied for most life, put a plus one, plus one counter on it if it's attacking the player with the most life or tied for the most life. Whenever Scourge of the Throne attacks for the first time each turn, if it's attacking the player with the most life or tied for most life, untap all attacking creatures, and after this phase, there is an additional combat phase. So as long as we're not on the throne and we got Scourge of the Throne out onto the battlefield, we should get a couple of attack phases. And with Xenagos pumping up a creature during each one of those combat phases, it's going to make very quick work of the table. All right, moving to a CMC of seven, we have a Tarka World Render. Five and Gruel for a 6-4 Flying Trampler. Whenever a dragon we control attacks, it gains double strike until end of turn. Drop down a Tarka, enable Xenagos, give it plus six, plus six, and send a 12-10 Flying Double Striking Hasty Trampling Dragon into combat. Next up with another dragon with a CMC of 7, we have Dracuseth Maw Flames. 4 and triple red for a 7-7 seven, seven flyer. Whenever Maw Flames here deals combat I'm sorry, whenever Dracuseth Maw Flames attacks, it deals 4 damage to any target and 3 damage to each of up to 2 other targets. So at a minimum, if we still are sitting at a table with at least 3 other opponents, Dracuseth Maw Flames is going to be able to reduce the life totals of each one of those opponents, and that's even before it hits with its combat damage. Or, if there's a bunch of dorks out onto the battlefield, Dracuseth can pick them off one by one. Next creature, we have Giant Edifage. 5 and 2 green for a 7-7 seven, seven trampling insect. When it deals combat damage to a player, we create a token that's a copy of Giant Edifage. This creature can close out a game very, very quickly, particularly if our opponents are not expecting to have to chump block all the way up to a power of 7. Next up, and the last creature in the CMC7 slot, and it is one of our best at protecting our biggins, and that's going to be Siege Behemoth. We have a 7-4 Hexproof, and as long as Siege Behemoth is attacking for each creature we control, we may have that creature assign its combat damage as though it weren't blocked. This is kind of like a Thorn Elemental type effect or a Rocks effect. Because our big trampling creatures are so imposing by themselves, our opponents may think twice having to try to block them if they're going to take the damage anyways. And if that's the case, that only means that we're going to achieve combat that much quicker. I'm sorry, that just means we're going to achieve victory through combat that much quicker. We're not going to achieve combat, we're going to achieve victory through combat. All right, let's move to a CMC of eight. We have Archetype of Endurance. It's six and two green for a six five. Creatures we control have hex proof. If we are running some biggins in play and trying to one shot or two shot opponents, it's going to be a premium to protect those investments. Archetype of Endurance will come down and give each one of those creatures hex proof. As an additional bonus, creatures our opponents control can't have hex proof and they lose hex proof as well. All right, next up, we have a beautiful creature to include in the 99 of this deck. It is the Stonehoof Chieftain, 7 and a green. It's an 8-8 trampling, indestructible centaur warrior. Whenever another creature we control attacks, it gains trample and indestructible until end of turn. Imagine together what Xenagos God of Revels and Stonehoof Chieftain can do to any of the biggins in the 99. If we get to combat and successfully hit off Xenagos, 
Xenagos's com or Xenagos's attack trigger, then we're going to have a creature that's going to get plus X plus X, where X is the power of that creature. It's going to get trample, indestructible, and haste. It's only a matter of time until we close out victory with that scenario. Next, we have Terastodon, six and two green. This evasionless elephant is a nine nine, but it's not being included because of its huge body. It comes into play, and when it does, we can destroy three target non-creature permanents. For each permanent put into a graveyard this way, its controller creates a three three green elephant creature token. We're playing commander, so there is a bevy of problematic and troublesome permanents that can really hanker down a game. Casting Terastodon or getting Terastodon onto the battlefield in different ways helps to alleviate those concerns by turning those permanents into 3-3 Elephants. Staying with the CMC of 8s, we have Utvara Halkite, a 6-6 flyer for 6 and 2 red. Whenever a dragon we control attacks, we create a 6-6 red dragon creature token with flying. As you've noticed, we have quite a number of dragons in the 99 of this deck thus far, so Utvara Halkite will never feel lonely. All right, another CMC 8, and our last one before we jump up, it's Woodfall Primus. 5 and 3 green is a 6-6 six, six trampler, and when it ETBs, we destroy target non-creature permanent. As a bonus, it has the Persist mechanic, which means when this creature dies, if it had no minus 1, minus 1 counters on it, we return it to play under its owner's control with a minus 1, minus 1 counter on it, which means we can destroy another non-creature permanent. We can 2 for 1 minimally with Woodfall Primus, as long as we have some non-creature permanents to target. We always will. This is Commander. All right, jumping from a CMC of 8 all the way up to a CMC of 11. We only have three creatures left to talk about in this subsection. And the next one, well, let's face it, this one could be a game ender. It's World Spine Worm 8 and triple green for a 15-15 trampler. When it dies, we create three 5-5 five, five green worm creature tokens with trample. Whenever World Spine Worm is put into a graveyard from anywhere, we shuffle it back into our library. So even if an opponent is able to destroy World Spine Worm, it's leaving behind three worms that are smaller, but they all add up to 15-15. Next up from 11 to 12, we got two creatures with a CMC of 12 before we close out this subsection. And if World Spine Worm wasn't enough to end the game, then maybe the Blightsteel Colossus will be. Our artifact creature is 12 as an 11-11 Trampling Infector. It also has Indestructible. If Blightsteel Colossus will be put into a graveyard from anywhere, shuffle it back into our library instead. As long as your playgroup is not super salty with introducing Infect into the game, then Blightsteel Colossus has a home in this deck. As you'll see moving forward, this is not, and in no way, shape, or form, a dedicated Infect deck. However, adding Blightsteel Colossus does help to move the game along rather quickly. And the last creature to include in this subsection of the deck is... Galta, Primal Hunger, 10 and 2 green, and I can promise you this, MTG Burgeoning Community, we are never paying 10 and 2 green to cast this creature, because Galta costs X less to cast, where X is the total power of creatures we control. It also has Trample, so it's not out of the realm of possibility to pay 2 green mana to cast a 12-12 Trampler, particularly with the number of biggins you've already seen in this deck. The following group of cards are used to help cheat our creatures onto the battlefield. We don't always want to pay the mana cost for our creatures because they're just so big. Paying 8, paying 10, paying 12, that's really going to hanker down our mana resources. So if we are able to include in the 99 any number of cards that can get our creatures onto the battlefield way ahead of curve, it's up to us to put them in there and use them. So leading things off for this subset of cards is Quicksilver Amulet. For a mana investment of 4, we can pay for, tap the Quicksilver Amulet, and put a creature card from our hand onto the battlefield. We can do this at any time because the dreaded activate only as a sorcery clause is not included. 
Following Quicksilver Amulet, we have Sneak Attack. Three in a red. It comes down as an enchantment. We can pay a red mana, choose a creature card from our hand, and put it into play. It has haste, and at the beginning of the end step, we sacrifice the creature. So they don't have staying power. However, with Xenagos and what his ability does, we don't need staying power with our creatures. We just need them to smash into our opponent's faces. Next up, another enchantment, we have Lurking Predators, 4 and 2 green. Let's make the decision to cast spells by our opponents terrifying, because when an, whenever an opponent casts a spell, we reveal the top card of our library. If it's a creature card, we put it onto the battlefield just like that, lickety split. Otherwise, we may put the card on the bottom of our library, putting a fresher card on top that may end up being a creature that could be triggered into play by one of our opponents casting a spell. You've already seen the creatures that could come into play just from activating a Lurking Predators. It will really give our opponents something to think about as they try to advance their board state. Next up, we have a sorcery. It is Salvala Stampede, four and double green. It has the Council's Dilemma mechanic, which means, starting with us, each player votes for wild or free. Reveal cards from the top of our library until we reveal a creature card for each wild vote. We put those creature cards onto the battlefield and then shuffle the rest into our library. We may put a permanent card from our hand onto the battlefield for each free vote. As long as we have a nice number of cards in our hand, particularly with some big old creatures casting a Savala, stamp, a Savala Stampede, regardless of it being wild or free, should really help out the board state and hopefully carry us right to victory. All right, next up with a CMC of six, this time we're going for an instant, and it's Summoning Trap, four and two green. If a creature spell we cast this turn was countered by a spell or an ability in opponent controls, we may pay zero rather than pay this 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 instance mana cost and when we do cast this either way we look at the top seven cards of our library and we put our creature card from among them onto the battlefield as you can see just the investment of six mana we're already ahead of the curve because of how many creatures are included with a mana value greater than six next up we have a classic this is and can be a game ending card for this gruel deck and any other deck that has green in it and it's tooth and nail five and two green we get to pick one we search our library for up to two creature cards reveal them and put them into our hand or we put two creature cards from our hand onto the battlefield for an additional two colorless mana, we can entwine both of these abilities. We can pay seven and two green and search our library for two creature cards, put them into our hand, and then put two creatures from our hand onto the battlefield. This is game ending. And the last cheat into play card we have in this Xenagos EDH deck is Finale of Devastation. X and two green at sorcery speed. We search our library and or graveyard for a creature card with converted mana cost X or less and put it onto the battlefield. If we search our library this way, of course we shuffle it. If X is 10 or more, creatures we control get plus X plus X and gain haste until end of turn. This is just an, a, a monumentally powerful card, not just because we can pluck any creature from our library and put it right into play, but we can also pull one from the graveyard. Finale of Devastation may be, in some instances, better and more powerful of a game-ending card than Tooth and Nail. All right, so let's talk about some of the removal and disruption spells we have in this deck. Now, we're playing Gruul, we're playing Smashy, so disruption and removal is not really prioritized because we want to get biggins in play, we want to attack with them, we want to one-shot with Xenagos, we want to send Haymakers. We don't really want to concern ourselves with too much of what our opponents are doing. So the removal and disruption is going to seem a little light, but it definitely is enough for us to get through an entire game. We're going to start off with probably the best removal spell in our colors, Beast Within. Destroy any target permanent. Its controller gets a 3-3 green beast creature token. With the number of problematic and troublesome permanents that you could see at a commander table, exchanging that permanent for a 3-3 beast creature, well, we'll take that every single day of the week and twice on Friday Night Magic. 
Next up, we have Crosin Grip. It's two and a green at instant speed, destroy target artifact or enchantment. More importantly, it has the split second mechanic, which means as long as this spell is on the stack, players can't cast spells or activate abilities that aren't mana abilities, including this spell may be a meta-specific preference, particularly if you're sitting down to a table with known combo players, because let's face it, there aren't many artifacts or enchantments that can be leaned on to complete any degenerate combos, right? No, there are too many, hence the inclusion of Cross and Grip. Next up, we have Decimate. Two and Gruel at sorcery speed. Destroy target artifact, destroy target creature, destroy enchant target enchantment, and destroy target land. So we are pretty much four for one when we cast Decimate. Next up, and a fantastically synergistic powerhouse to include in this type of deck is Chandra's Ignition. Three and two red at sorcery speed. Target creature we control deals damage equal to its power to each other creature and each opponent. So imagine, just imagine, we trigger Xenagos to create one of our biggins to become even more big. We get to our second main phase and then we cast Chandra's Ignition and then just win the game right there. If our opponent's life totals are whittled down even slightly, we can definitely use this card as an ultimate win condition. Speaking of wiping out the board, we are going to include a copy of Star of Extinction. Four and double red at sorcery speed, we get to destroy target land, and then Star of Extinction deals 20 damage to each creature and each planeswalker. Again, they, this, the inclusion of this card may be more of a meta-specific addition, particularly if you have known players that love to play Super Friends or have problematic planeswalkers, including Star of Extinction is a great way to deal with them. And lastly, since we've got red in the deck, we must put in the Blasphemous Act, eight and a red. And I can assure you, MTGBC, we are never casting this for eight and a red. We are most likely only paying one red mana in order to deal 13 damage to each creature because Blasphemous Act costs one less to cast for each creature on the battlefield. All right, on the following set of cards in this subsection of the video, well, we're just going to refer to these as our miscellaneous spells. They're going to help synergize and enhance everything that we're trying to do in the deck. And let's start off with a beautiful card, Berserk. One green mana at instant speed. We can only cast Berserk before the combat damage step. And when we do, target creature gains trample and gets plus X plus zero until end of turn, or X is its power. So if we're just trying to one-shot an opponent with a Xenagos activated creature, casting Berserk can really finish the job. Now, unfortunately, it says at the beginning of the next end step, we destroy that creature if it attacked this turn. So unfortunately, we will lose the creature if we so target one of ours, but that's the nature of the game. We're running Gruul, we're smashing through with big, huge creatures. Sometimes they're going to hit the yard. However, we should also point out that Berserk can be used on one of our opponent's creatures. There's a lot of, I guess we could say, combat, combat chicanery and shenanigans that can take place when we have Berserk in our hand. Next up, we have Strionic Resonator, because what's better than one Xenagos ability? How about copying that triggered ability so we can do it twice? That's what we can do with Strionic Resonator. For a mana investment of two, we can pay two, tap this, and copy target triggered ability we control. More likely than not, we're going to double up another doubled power with Xenagos's, with Xenagos's triggered ability. Next up, we talked about earlier in this video protecting some of our creatures that are going into combat because we invest so many resources in trying to send them off to a one or two shot for an opponent. Well, let's make sure that we can protect them further with some spot protection. Hence, deflecting SWAT to an red at instant speed. However, if we control Xenagos, 
we may cast this spell without paying its mana cost, and when we do, we may choose new targets for target spell or ability. So any one of our opponents that are trying to dastardly take care of one of our biggins, we just cast Deflecting Swat and change the target of that spot removal spell to one of their own. Another way to protect our dudes is with Rhythm of the Wild, an enchantment for one and a gruel. Creature spells we control can't be countered, because if we can't get them onto the battlefield, we can't do anything with them. As an additional bonus, non-token creatures we control have Riot, which means they enter the battlefield with haste or a plus one plus one counter. So if for any reason Xenagos is indispensable and it's in the command zone and we just can't get to it, we still have the opportunity to give our creatures haste by choosing riots and by choosing to give them haste through riot on Rhythm of the Wild. Next up, we have Greater Good, two and two green. Simply put, sacrifice a creature, draw cards equal to the sacrifice creature's power, then discard three cards. Having this card onto the battlefield and under our control is a great way to keep our hands filled with gas so we can keep sending those biggins into combat one after another. Speaking of drawing cards by sacrificing a creature, we're going to talk about Momentous Fall, two and two green at instant speed. As an additional cast, as an additional cost to cast Momentous Fall, we sacrifice a creature. We draw cards equal to the sacrificed creature's power, then we gain life equal to its toughness. So this is a great way to preserve one of our creatures that may be targeted for exile by an opponent. Or this is a great way to get some value off of one of our creatures that's about to hit the yard from an imminent board wipe or a spot removal spell that we just can't stop. So let's sacrifice it. Let's get a ton of cards into our hand and let's gain some incidental life as well. Next up, we have Nylea Keen-Eyed. Three and a green as a 5-6 indestructible legendary enchantment god. As long as our devotion to green is less than five, Nylea is not a creature. Creature spells we cast cost one less to cast. That will help to get big creatures onto the battlefield even ahead of Kerr, making them even more of a threat if we can get Nylea onto the battlefield early in the game. Additionally, it has the bonus of paying two and a green to reveal the top card of our library, and if it's a creature card, we put it into our hand. If not, we may choose to put it into our, gra into our graveyard. So this is a way in which to filter the top card of our library so we can get a creature into our hand, keep getting them into play, and keep sending them at our opponents. Next up with card draw in mind, it's Return of the Wild Speaker. Four and a green, we get to pick one at instant speed. Non-human creatures we control get plus three, plus three until end of turn. Now granted, there are some token synergies within the deck, but that's not what this gruel build is all about. So more likely than not, we will be selecting Return of the Wild Speaker's first mode, which is drawing cards equal to the greatest power among non-human creatures we control. And if you go back to the number of creatures we have in this deck with just unbelievable powers, we're going to keep our hands filled throughout the game. All right, a few cards left. Next up for a combat shenanigans instance, we have Savage Beating. Three and two green. We play Savage Beating only during our turn and only during combat. We get to pick one of the following two modes. Creatures we control gain double strike until end of turn, or we untap all creatures we control, and after this phase, there is an additional combat phase. However, if we pay the entwine cost of one and a red, we can pay a total of four and three red mana in order to give all creatures we have we control double strike and give them an additional attack phase. This is a game-ending card. This is one of the win conditions of the deck. Savage Beating. All right, next up, let's talk about a green tutor that was built just for Commander. That is Shared Summons. Three and two green at instant speed. We search our library for up to two creature cards with different names, reveal them, and put them into our hand. So this in some way is tooth and nail light, but it is only a CMC of five. It is at instant speed, and we can get any two biggins straight from our library right into our hand. Two cards remaining. The next one, 
We did a little bit of foreshadowing earlier when we were talking about Goto Bandit Warlord and how its ETB trigger allows us to search our library for an equipment card and put that equipment into play. I had mentioned during that subsection of this video that, as a spoiler, there's only one equipment in this deck, and that is Ember Cleave. Four and two red. This is a legendary equipment with flash. This spell costs one less to cast for each attacking creature we control. When Ember Cleave enters the battlefield, we attach it to target creature we control. Equip creature gets plus one, plus one, and has double strike and trample. This has an equip cost of three. Now, one of the best ways in which to pull off a victory in this deck, cast your tooth and nail, make Goto one of the creatures that comes into play, make, I don't know, maybe Blightsteel Colossus or World Spine Worm as the second. Both of those creatures hit the battlefield at the same time. Goto says ETB trigger triggers. We seek out Ember Cleave. We slap Ember Cleave onto the Blightsteel Colossus or the World Spine Worm. We enable Xenagos' ability. We turn that big in sideways, and we prepare for the next game. And the last miscellaneous spell that we are going to talk about in this subsection is Reap the Past. X and Gruel at Sorcery Speed. Return X cards at random from our graveyard to our hand, and then we exile Reap the Past. With the amount of mana we could generate in this deck, this spell really could read, Return your graveyard to your hand. Now we're going to talk about the mana base of this deck and bring this deck tech to a close. First we're going to start with our ramp spells and then we'll transition into the actual installation of the land base. We're going to start with the single greatest artifact in our format and that's going to be Soul Ring. If you don't have a Soul Ring, you need to get one. Next up we're going to include Thought Vessel. This is going to help us ramp out Plus, it's going to provide no maximum hand size because we do have a number of spells in this deck that allow us to draw chunks of cards. And for me, I'd rather keep those cards in my hand than discard them into the graveyard. Next up, we have another one of the best artifacts in this format. It is Arcane Signet. For just an investment of two mana, we can tap and add a green or a red to our mana pool. Going along with that idea, we have Gruel Signet, an investment of two colorless mana. However, we needed colorless mana to tap this and add a red and green to our mana pool. It's a little clumsy, but it does help out with the mana ramping. Next, we have the original Kodama's Reach. Two and a green. We search our library for two basic lands, reveal them, put one onto the battlefield tapped, and one into our hand. A spell that was just so good, they printed it again with just another name, and that is Cultivate. So we can consider Cultivate to be Kodama's Reach 2.0. Next up, with the mana value of four, we're going to talk about Sky Shroud Claim. We're going to search our library for up to two forest cards and put them onto the battlefield. It's important to note that it says forest cards and not basic forests, because with it saying forest cards, we can seek out cards like the Battle Land or the Shock Land that are in our appropriate colors. That is Cinder Glade and Stomping Ground. Next, we have Thran Dynamo, one of the best investments of mana that we can get. We invest four mana into this, and each time we turn it sideways, we get three back. That's going to help us cast our biggins a lot, a lot more ahead of curve if we're unable to cheat them onto the battlefield. With that in mind, we're going to up the CMC from four to five and talk about Gilded Lotus. We turn Gilded Lotus sideways to get three mana just like three and Dynamo. However, this three mana is of any one color. And the last mana rock that we're going to talk about in this deck, and it is a doozy, particularly for what we're trying to do in this deck, it is the Great Henge for 7 and 2 green. And I can promise you, MTG Burgeoning community, we are never paying 7 and 2 green for this artifact. Because it costs X less to cast, where X is the greatest power among creatures we control. You've already seen the number of high-powered creatures we have in this deck, so we will most likely be paying just 2 green mana for this legendary artifact and when we do we can turn it sideways to add two green mana to our mana pool and gain two life.
life, and whenever a non-token creature enters the battlefield under our control, we put a plus one, plus one counter on it, and we draw a card, one of the most powerful artifacts in the format, particularly in a gruel build where we're trying to one-shot our opponents. And those are their mana ramp spells, so now let's start talking about the installation of the land base. We're going to start off with some basic lands. We have a swath of basic forests. One, two, three, four, five, six. We have eight basic forests. And if you are a fan of the channel, you know what's coming next. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We have eight basic mountains. We love symmetry here at MTG Burgeoning. We're playing two colors, so let's make sure that those two colors have equal representation with the basic lands. The next chunk of lands are all lands that can provide a red or a green mana. The first is going to be Cinderglade. This was the battle land we referenced earlier when we were talking about casting Sky Shroud Claim. Next up, we have probably the best land in our format. It is a Command Tower. It's going to tap for a red or a green. We have a Firelit Thicket. This is going to tap only for a colorless mana unless we put a red or green mana into it, turn it sideways, and add any two mana of Gruel Colors. Next, we have Fungal Reaches. We're going to tap this for a colorless mana. We're going to tap a mana, tap this to put a storage counter on it, and then we're going to tap one mana to remove X storage counters from Fungal Reaches to add X mana in any combination of Gruel Colors. I can attest to the power of this card if we get it in the early game, and if we get it in the late game, then we're just tapping it for colorless mana. Next up, we have Grove of the Burn Willows. We'll tap it for a colorless, or we'll tap it for a red or a green. If we so choose the secondary option, each opponent gains one life. We don't care about one life. We're running Gruel. Next, we have Moss Fire Valley. We tap a colorless. We tap this land. We add a red and green mana to our mana pool. Raging Ravine is going to enter the battlefield tapped, and generally that is a detriment and a reason why I do not include any lands that come into play tapped in any of my decks. However, if the benefit outweighs the potential risk, then I will definitely reconsider, and we do make that case with Raging Ravine. It enters tapped, we can tap for a red or a green, but we can also pay two and a gruel, and until end of turn, Raging Ravine becomes a 3-3 red and green elemental creature with, whenever this creature attacks, we put a plus one, plus one counter on it. So this has a great deal of synergy with Xenagos, particularly during a game in which there is a heavy control feature at the, on the battlefield. All right, next we have our Gruel Checkland, Rootbound Crag. It's going to enter untapped if we control a mountain or a forest. We have Spire Garden. It's our Gruel fan land. It'll enter untapped as long as we control two or more opponents. We have the aforementioned Stomping Ground. It is a forest mountain, or I'm sorry, it is a mountain forest, one of the targets for our Sky Shroud claim. And lastly, we have Rockfall Vale. It's going to enter the battlefield tapped unless we control two or more other lands. The odds are in our favor that we're going to have this card in our hand when we already have two lands or more on the battlefield. And from a colored mana perspective, the last land we're going to talk about here is Craig Crown Pathway. Now, this is not going to give us the option of tapping for a red or a green. We must make that decision before we play the land. If we need the red mana, it's coming down as is. However, if we need the green mana, then we're just going to transform it into Timber Crown Pathway and then tap that bad boy for green mana for as much as we're in the game. All right, and lastly, we have a slew of lands that are all going to provide us colorless mana with some additional utilitarian benefits. The first is just going to be a straight ancient tomb. We have biggins. We want to get them out into play as quickly as possible. Ancient tomb gives us two colorless mana in exchange for two life. Next, we have Bonders Enclave. Taps for a colorless mana. However, we can pay three, tap this, and draw a card which we can only activate if we control a creature with power 4 or greater. I got news for you folks, every single creature card in this deck is power 4 or greater. Field of Ruin is going to help keep the battlefield clear of any troublesome lands. 
And I'm going to tell you right now, one of the most troublesome lands for this deck is going to be Maze of Ith. So Field of Ruin should really be called Ruining Mazes Ith, or Ruining Maze of Ith. We can tap this for a colorless. We can pay two and sacrifice Field of Ruin to destroy target non-basic land and opponent controls. Then, as a potential drawback, each player searches their library for a basic land and puts it onto the battlefield. Now, I don't like gifting opponents with lands. However, I don't want my huge creature getting untapped during every single combat. So Field of Ruin is included to take out Maze of If. Next up, we have Homeward Path. This land is included just to make sure that none of these blue or red mages take our creatures. We can get them right back by turning this sideways and having every player gain control of each creature they own. Next up, we have Kessig Wolf Run. It taps for a color this, but we can tap X, a red and a green, and target creature gets plus X, plus O, and gains trample until end of turn. As we referenced earlier in this video, we did have some spells and effects that provide evasion to our creatures. Kessig Wolf Run is one of them. Next up, we have Reliquary Tower. This is the land version of Thought Vessel. And again, I reiterate, I don't want to discard cards that are in my hand in excess of seven. I want them in my hand. Rogue's Passage, as if our creatures weren't threatening enough, making them unblockable will make very quick work of one or more of our opponents. Next up, we have Temple of the False God. This is Ancient Tomb with the big drawback because we need to have at least five total lands to turn this sideways and get two colorless mana. And card number 99 to fill out this deck tech, we have Yavi Maya Hollow. Tap for a colorless mana or we can pay a green, tap this and regenerate target creature. This is one of the effects we've included in the deck as a way in which to protect our heavily invested biggins. And there you have it, MTG Burgeoning Community. This is the God, the Xenagos God of Revels Gruel EDH deck. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. This is MTG Burgeoning, your channel for all things magic.